people back there. So, good morning, everybody. God's good, man. All the time, that's right. God is good. And, uh, huh. I've been talking with the Lord a lot this morning. I'm going to share just a little something before uh, we get started because I thought it was pretty cool. You know, we have a cool God. Right, of course, what is cool? <laughs> cool is what's in your mind, I suppose. We all have a different idea of cool. But this was pretty cool to me. Because I, I am going to have, uh, we, we have a, a team here from Nigeria. I am going to have Ali and Michael come up and just, just to give an update of some things going on there. But I want to tell you this story. It's not a bedtime story like last week. The Paul came up to me and he said, I couldn't sleep after that bedtime story. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry about that. But it was a pretty cool story. Have you ever flown with Jesus? And that's kind of rhetorical. I'm not expecting an answer. But have you ever flown with Jesus? And I, I don't mean that you hopped on an airplane and you know he's with you and he'll get you there. I'm, I'm talking literally. Have you flown with Jesus? Has he taken you to where you're flying almost like it feels like you're flying like Superman, but he's holding you? See, until a week ago, I would have said, no, I've never experienced that. But I would have been incomplete in saying that because he showed me through this experience this week, and I've literally, I don't think I told anybody this, maybe Brooke. I don't know if I even told her. But there was a song that maybe 20 years ago was so significant in my life. And there was a series of songs. I, I, I don't know if you guys probably will relate to this, where, where I, I did this, this switch in my life from a legalistic mind frame into a Okay, there's a lot of possibilities with God. You know, there's, there's this, what does this hope, this love mean, you know, this faith mean with God? And for me, he did that through worship. He did that through music. Because it was with music that even growing up, I, I, would, I would listen to music and it would have this heavy impact on me. Good or bad, by the way, <laughs> depending on the music, Right? But when I went through this transition of really recognizing what God was trying to show me and recognizing what it was, it was, it was literally the instrument of music. And so there are several songs that I can look back on and say this impacted my life and still impacts my life today. And there's one artist in particular that it, it bothered me that I never got to meet him um, because I did get to meet a lot of them back when we had a contract with uh, different story, sorry, but it bugged me that I never got to meet him or even see him in concert or anything else. How many here have heard of Daryl Evans? Anybody? I mean, he, there you go, one person. There is one godly person in this place. <laughs> I'm kidding. But Daryl Evans was, and, and is, I think he still tours actually. He's, he's uh, a little younger than me. But he was a guy whose music absolutely captured my heart. Um, there's a song that we sing that has been sung by so many people that he actually wrote, and nobody knows that he wrote it. <laughs> and, and yet, probably every worship team in the world has played it. Can't think of the name of it. <laughs> I was literally just listening to it. It's the one I, I used to tell you, Josh, let's play that when we did the band. Let's do this again. Let's, it's, it's the one where you pick and it's about, about intimacy with God. Ah, whatever. Huh? Yeah, it is a lot of songs. I know I'm being a little vague there. Anyways, nobody knows who he is, but, but one of his albums just captured my heart in a time that I was saying, 
Lord, what I know of you can't be all of who you are. Because this is not a picture of who Jesus was. So I, I, I need to know you. I want to know you. And I would listen to this music. And that was way back with the original Hillsong. Remember, what was her name? I'm so bad with memory stuff. Thank you, Darlene Sheck. Is that right? Did I get that right? All that time, God using music to just open my eyes. Well, there was this one song that I would dare say nobody's ever heard of. Probably it's, it's by Daryl Evans called I'm in Love with You, Lord. And it, it's kind of a cool song, but it, and, and literally the song is a love song to the Lord. I'm in love with you. But there was a part in it that literally was half the song. You think the song's coming to an end. Then it goes into this guitar solo. No singing. This guitar solo that was a layered guitar. It, you know, it, it, effectively, if they were doing it live and not using layers, they, it probably was at least two, maybe three guitarists. But yet he did it all himself. And... I used to listen to that and back it up. Listen to it again, back it up. And, it, and the guitar solo was probably four or five minutes. Just the guitar solo. And I'm listening to this, and I remember way back then where I would just feel like I'm just seeing things. Like I'm flying over mountains. Or, or I'm doing this, I'm coming over this area, I'm, you know, in, in, in my mind I'm imagining this and think, oh, that is cool. You know, it wasn't a surprise because I used to do that with bad side of music too. That would take me places in understanding the feeling of what was going on. I'm not going to talk about that. But... I always felt like something was going on and I didn't know what it was. This last week, I was singing that song. And the, the solo comes on, and, and I'm already wrecked in my spirit anyways because I've been with the Lord, I've been worshiping Him, I've just been laying it all out before Him, and all of a sudden this, this guitar solo comes on and it, it starts real slow and real low and begins and all of a sudden I'm seeing myself fly again things that I had recognized 20 years ago I'm seeing mountains you know, I'm flying over, over these, these um, lands underneath me and no, nothing defined like you know I'm flying over New York you know, nothing like that it was over his creation and I look to my right and Jesus is with me and I thought, you were there 20 years ago. That was real 20 years ago, even though I had no idea that was real when it happened. I thought I was making it up in my mind. But yet the experience this week showed me that what he was doing was teaching me who he was teaching me that there are possibilities in relationship to him that do not make sense. Wow, isn't that exactly what the Bible says? That in relationship with him, he does things sometimes that don't make sense because he wants us to know him. He wants us to trust him. I'm going to have you guys wait. I probably should have had you do it first. <laughs> Be a little weird to stop right now. The Lord's telling me that. Let's pray. Father, we worship you and we praise you and we love you. And Father, I give this to you. I give you my mouth. I give you my hands, my feet. I give you my will most of all that you, Father, will work in me and make the choices. Nobody here, including myself, has a desire to hear from me. We have come here before your throne, Father, to hear from you and you alone. 
for it is you who have the key to truth. It is you who loves us with a perfect love. Thank you for that. Thank you, Lord. And we just pray, as your Holy Spirit has already been here, Father, we pray that you permeate this place, that you open our hearts to an understanding that only your Holy Spirit can convey. Not logic, not education, but your spirit. Father, that is what I trust. And I pray that you do your will this morning. I didn't know what today would look like, as I've told you, it, it, that's been the case many times. And, and um, even this morning getting here, you know, I reach over to Alexis during worship and, and I said, Alexis, you know, pray. <laughs> he, he's not told me yet. I got one more song, pray. Then I'm thinking, well, you know what? We, we need an update from Nigeria, so I'll, I can have them go up and maybe he'll talk to me then. I say this as a testimony because literally when Brooke, I think it was when that last song was finishing, and she was talking, or it might have been when she was praying or whatever, the Lord starts giving me these verses. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I need a little more time. Because I got to pull it up and my hands shake. But what he has for us this morning is significant. For those of you who were here last week and who've, who've been part of I, I'm going to call it a series. I mean, we don't plan on anything to be a series, but it's been probably five or six weeks now with me preaching four of those, Alexis one and Bryn one, where it was all about the same subject. So I'm going to call that a series. Maybe we'll go back and rename them, you know, series. I don't know. But it was about the landscape of what God's creation is. It's about the landscape of what he intends it to be and not how we know the world right now. And there were some hard words there. There were some difficult things to understand there. I get it. Man alive, if, if I have to go back and, and listen to it a few times, and I'm the one that he spoke through, then perhaps I understand that it takes a little bit going back and really diving into this. But that's exactly what God wants. You know, he doesn't want you to be just a Sunday Christian or a Tuesday Christian. He wants you to be someone that dives into his will and his word. Because there's something that you're supposed to produce. We call it a testimony. Right? There's something that a church is supposed to produce. It's called a testimony. It's how people see you, how people see your church, how people see the group of people that you're a part of. There is a testimony that comes out of that. There is something that we are to hold on to that other people are supposed to see. And that's one of the first verses he took me to this morning. I want you to go there. It's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Because Paul begins this book talking about the testimony of the church at Thessalonica. Chapter 1, verse 2 says this, and and Paul is just opening up his epistle here. He says, we give thanks to God always for you, or for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfast of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. What Paul was proclaiming was this church had a testimony. Those people had a testimony. 
And he was proclaiming what that was. He said, a work of faith. How many in here think that faith is just something you decide to do and then it's there? Or on the flip side, how many in here believe that faith takes work? There you go. Yeah, faith takes work. Faith is not easy to do. And what level of faith God has called you to is the higher the, higher the faith, the higher the difficulty. How often have we put ourselves in ham shoes? You know, how many of us could say, if God told me to go and take my child up on top of the mountain and sacrifice them, that I would actually do it? I don't know. I thank God that that was Abraham's calling and not mine. Now, I'm not saying I wouldn't do it. I'm just saying that wasn't my calling. But do you know I've experienced in my own life the same crazy expectations that God has for belief? And if you haven't experienced it, God wants you to. Because faith is work. Faith takes effort. Faith takes taking the natural realm of what we know and saying, God, I believe you, not what I see. And man alive, if we are not stuck in that as a nation right now, stuck in that as a bride right now. And and sadly, the majority of the bride are failing that test because it's work. Faith is not bestowed upon you and here's a gift, you just get to have this faith now. Faith is something that grows when exercised. Ooh, man, I don't like that word. How many like the word exercise except for my wife? I, I won't include her in here. She'll be the first to stand. I don't like the word exercise. I played college football and I hated the word exercise. When we did three a days in 104 degree temperature down in in Virginia on an island that I'm positive Satan owned. (laughs) I know he owned it. Personally, there was only one on the island. It was on this rickety old bridge. And, and I remember we would drive over in these buses thinking, this thing's going to come down one day. And guess what? By the way, it did. It did. Probably 10 years later, this is down in Lynchburg at Liberty. 10 years later, came down, uh, what is that, James River or whatever it was, flooded the thing out, knocked the bridge down. Now they can't use the island anymore. That was a good day for me. <laughs> Nobody got hurt. That was a good day for me. But I remember... In that exercise and having to go through those three a days thinking, why am I doing this? Why? Is it to be healthy? Not at that age. At that age, you think you're healthy no matter what. As a football player, nothing could stop me. I could eat what I wanted, not gain any weight. Not sure where that went. But the exercise made me strong. It made me capable of hitting the other guy harder than he was going to hit me. It made me be able to absorb the hits. It took exercise to do that. Why do we think that faith doesn't take that same exercise? It does. God gives us a little call to faith. Here, believe this. And when we believe and exercise that faith, he then gives us more and gives us more and gives us more. Abraham did not start with that test in his life. Abraham had already built up an intimacy with the Lord. First of all, to even know that it was the Lord telling him that. And that's pretty huge. But then he had built up his faith in God to know this in Scripture in, in uh, Hebrews 11, to know that, okay, God, whatever you do, 
you, you can resurrect him. Even that thought blows my mind. Because he still would have had to go through the process of that death. The process of it being at his own hand. I mean, think of the extraordinary expression of that faith. How about Noah? Think of the expression extraordinary expression of his faith when he lives in this corrupt world. Insanely corrupt, by the way. And we won't get into that. I mean, we talked about that the last five or six weeks a little bit. There's a lot more to that. Oh man, we could spend all year on that. But he lived in this corrupt society where in reality, he was pretty alone. <laughs> I mean, the fact that only his family was saved is evidence of that. But yet he believed God. Now, I don't know about you, but when God told him, go build this boat because in 120 years it's going to rain and you're going to need it. It wasn't like, okay, I'm going to believe you and I'm going to get my faith realized next week. 120 years. He had to build his faith through the evidence of him building this boat. Something that had never been needed before. And he did this because he simply trusted God for what God said. He didn't have the word of God. Let me, let me open up you know, to Genesis chapter 6 and see what I'm supposed to do. He didn't have that. He had relationship with the Lord in the purity of his generations, the Bible says. He had relationship with the Lord and trust with him to step in a faith that made no sense. Guys, for 2,000 years, 2,000 years, God has put us on the hook for not requiring a lot of faith. But those times are different now. For 2,000 years, he was saying, I offer this life to you, you have to believe. But what makes you think that the God of the Old Testament, the God of the flood, the God of David, the God of Abraham, what makes you think that he put all of that to rest, and that now all he requires is for you to believe that Jesus died on the cross. He requires a lot more than that. Not, not for justification of sin, let me be very clear. This is not about your ticket. And man, if, if you have not done that yet, none of this will make sense. This is coming from the standpoint of you knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior and building your relationship with him. He's requiring more now. Why? I don't know. It may boil down to just the fact that it's time. It's time. If you've waited for your spouse, if you will, us being the bride of Christ, if you've waited for your spouse for 2,000 years, how impatient would you get? I, I mean, I think that's pretty patient. But yet there comes a time when the cries of the few outweigh the wants of the many. That's what's going on now. God has heard the cries of his remnant, and what I mean by that is in their prayers, they're praying in faith. Not, help me, God, help me, God. It's so bad here. All these people, they're so bad, and you know we've, we've got these, these crazy people leading our government, and, and we've, you know, I've got this neighbor down the street, and you know, blah, 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 blah. All that is is complaining to God. Instead, what God has been listening to is a remnant praying to him and say, God, I believe you. I trust you. I know that you are God. I know that you are righteous. I know that your love demands justice. Because that is an equivalent part of who he is. 
The Bible says he is righteous. And so the remnant cry out and say, in faith, I believe you. I believe. I believe you intend to do something with us, to make us a ready bride. Why? Because you said it in your word. You said in Revelation 3, 9, that you're going to bring your bride in this life, not in heaven, in this life. Bring your bride to a place where the world recognizes who her God is. So all of this is coming, and the remnant is praying in faith. We not, Lord, man, I really hope this is true. It sounds so good. I, I want it to be true. I, 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 that's not a prayer of faith. A prayer of faith is a declaration that God, you have said it, I believe it, I declare it. Because I have representation in this realm. And that's important, by the way. You ever wonder how Satan got the deed to the earth? He got it through Adam. Wait a second. You know, God created the earth, not Adam. But God gave it to Adam in authority. So Adam, because he was in this realm, he had authority over that. When that was taken, it had to be claimed by someone in this realm. That's why Jesus Christ came. That's why God inserted himself to become a man. Because he had to become of this realm to literally purchase back that authority. And he did. Praise God he did and he rose. But you know he never claimed it. To this day, he has not claimed that right. He paid for it. If he claimed it, we'd all be sitting in a whole different situation, wouldn't we? Why do you think? Why do you think he didn't claim it? Because when you are married, you become one flesh. Get out of your mind the sexual connotations of that because that's not what God means. When we talk about love here on this earth, we think, oh, sex. Or or that that intimacy of feelings, of emotion, and and the, the physical aspects of that. And God's like, ah, they don't get it. To become one flesh is to become one in unity to be completely unified. What do you think Christ wants with his bride? He wants that unity. The power is not in some gifting that we're given. And I'm not saying that there isn't power there, although compared to what he, what he is about to do, it really isn't. That's certainly not the power, certainly not the authority. If it was, we'd be in a different situation right now because we've got prophets, we've got apostles, we've got these people declaring all sorts of things and everything else. But guess what? The real thing is the bride is not unified. So what Jesus paid for 2,000 years ago, he never claimed as his right because his other half has not been a part of it. That's what he's doing. He's rising up an army. That's why our tagline, I don't even know where it is. An army rising up. By the way, that wasn't me. That wasn't anybody on our team. That was Jesus who said that. He said, I want this to be your tagline because you're an army rising up. It is the very remnant of his bride that is rising up to bring unity with him and Jesus Christ to claim the right that is his, that he already paid for. What is that right? Revelation 3, 9, the rulership of this earth. Literally, Matthew 6, 33, the bringing of his kingdom to this place. The very thing that was lost when Adam gave it away. It wasn't, it wasn't the loss was not just this intimacy with God. It was not just that they were clothed in light, now they're not clothed in light, and they got to put on skin. You know, the, the calf skins and stuff. 
That, that wasn't the loss. Just the intimacy that was lost. It was the fact that his kingdom no longer was, it was in a separated state from where we were. We no longer were in his kingdom. And yet Jesus came to pay. He said, if I have come, I have come to bring my kingdom. He's bringing his kingdom here. So why doesn't he, in all his authority, all his, his passion, everything else, just blink and make it so? Because his partner's got to be on board with him. His partner, who is his bride, who, who is with him, is to be a part of this. What is that part? Faith. It, it's, it's not ability. It's not that, well, we got to train up a bunch of really awesome warriors that can fight with a sword or a bow or know how to launch nuclear weapons. <laughs> it's not that. Because Ephesians 6 says we don't war with flesh and blood. We war with principalities, with powers. We war with things we cannot see. So it is by faith that we act in that war. It is by faith that we step in unity with God. Now the beautiful thing is it's never about faith alone. Because faith something says in Hebrews 1 that faith is the evidence of things hoped for, right? So what does it produce? It produces hope. Let's go back to that verse. In 1 Thessalonians. Remembering before our God the Father the work of your faith, the labor of your love, and the steadfast of your hope. Those are not small things. How many believe for a while? And by the way, if you haven't gotten this now, you'll, you'll get it. When we make a statement of faith before God, and we make it in this realm... Guess who hears you? Satan and his realm. He hears you and immediately he has a right. He has a right to test that. If you don't believe that, then you may as well take the whole book of Job out of Because that's a Job. In fact, the, if you want to really understand the book of Job, recognize that it is all happening in a court. Because that's exactly what it is. It's happening in the court of heaven. Satan had a right. He had a, he had a right to test that faith. Why? Because he was the prince in the power of the air. He was the rightful ruler of this realm. So when we have faith in something, <clears throat> excuse me, something other than him, he has a right to test that. When we have faith in something true, something of God that is beyond, above the enemy, Satan has a right to test it. So the second you have this choice of faith and you walk in this faith, what happens? <laughs> Man, you get hit. You get hit. You get hit. You don't even see him coming. It's like boom, boom, boom. Why? Because Satan has a right to test that faith. But there's another reason. Faith that is untested is not faith. Do you understand that? Faith that does it, James says faith without works is dead. Faith without you walking through that has no bearing. I could tell you all day that I believe in, in God turning around Benway State, Nigeria, turning around all of Nigeria, all of Africa, to where that continent will become the, the, just the most amazing place on earth. Am I cutting all the time? All right. Yeah, it's time we buy another one. Thank you very much. 
Yeah, I have to walk like this. <laughs> All right. Here. Is it, so I'll turn this off then. All right. Forgot the last thing I said. What'd you say, John? Ah, uh, Benway State, yes. If I just believed that God's going to do that, he's going he's gonna to make Benway everything that he's told us and make it shine and make it literally be the place where revival starts and, and, and goes out throughout the world, and yet I never went there. What, what kind of faith is that? I mean, I could believe it. But my faith without action means nothing. Satan would sit back and say, he was called to go to Nigeria and he didn't go. That faith does nothing to me. That faith means nothing in the kingdom of God. But yet when we follow through with that faith and we step into things that God tells us to do, then something is produced that is out of our capability. Just like Abraham. <laughs> I mean, imagine what God promised him, that, that your descendants will be more than the stars. I, I don't know about you, but that's a lot. Or then the sand of the sea. I used to live near the ocean. I used to go to the beach every day. I'm pretty sure there's more sand than there are stars. Maybe not. Either way, can't count them. And what he was telling Abraham is, you have to believe beyond what you think. There's an effort to that. And by walking in that faith, you are telling God that I believe. By, by Abraham walking up that mountain with Isaac in his hand, knowing full well that he trusted God no matter what, even though he might have to go through with it. He trusted God. Now, that's an awesome place to be. Because that's where you realize and you go through these things in your mind, is that really God? Every one of you has been at this place before. You will be there again. Is this God? That's a tough thing to answer before you walk in it. It's a really tough thing. Because faith does not come because there is a guarantee I'm God, let me show you. Let me take you to heaven and, and show you all these things about how I am God so you could go down to earth and believe that I am God. God, God doesn't do that. He takes the faith that we have and the faith that we offer and he works with it. And he pushes it. And he has expectation for it to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then perhaps he takes us up to heaven and shows us. I don't know. I think it depends on where our faith is. It depends on what we give him. But faith without that action is nothing. You can be in your life right now. You can know all these things intellectually. And you could choose not to step in them. Some people hear God's calling you to something that you're ignoring. God's calling you to something that you're afraid of. God's calling you to something that you have said, well, I, I think that's him, but I just don't know that that's him. Don't you think that he can keep that work that he began in you safe? Of course he can. Of course he can. When we step in faith to something that we don't know, then it, it, it's, it's not like he's like, yeah, I hope they'll be okay. Good luck, hope to see you at the end, and if I see you at the end, I got another task for you. He doesn't do that. He takes our hand and he said, let me walk with you. Let me walk with you. Let me give you confidence through this whole thing because you're not going to feel confident. 
You're not going to feel this is the Lord. You're not going to feel, wait a second, this isn't how the world works. How are we to believe that God is about to change everything in this country? And he is. Now, by the way, can I say something here because it bugs me? I know there are a lot of prophets out there, and I love them. I love them, but they're wrong. If you think and you put your trust in a governmental leader, whether it be Trump or whether it be a thousand other people, then you're missing the point. You're missing the point that Jesus Christ is the one who said he is going to do it. And he's not going to share his glory with anyone. Now, don't confuse that with saying that he's not going to use these people. He is. Trump is his anointed man. He is going to be back in office, but it is not him that is going to bring change to this country. It is God. It is his bride. It is his bride walking in faith because of the calling that she has. And it is through that power that Jesus Christ will bestow on his remnant, on those who are willing to walk in faith, that all of a sudden, this world is going to see things it's never seen before. That's a big statement. Things that weren't seen in the flood. Things that weren't seen when they went and took the promised land. Wow, I mean, even if we just saw that, that would be pretty incredible. You know, what, what would you think if the Lord told us to go, you know, the, the remnant, go walk around the Capitol building seven times and then shout? See what happens. I mean, that would be extraordinary, right? But yet that isn't even close to what God's doing. And, and I can't even quantify what he's doing except to say that it is something that has never happened before. Whew. But it'll be God. It'll be God. He will not share his glory with anybody, although he will use his bride to do it. But what will his bride do? The ones he uses, what will they do? They will say, it wasn't me. Don't look at me. It was him. It was all him. In fact, my only job is to be a conduit for him. My only job is to be a conduit as pure as I could be for him to work through me to do his will. By the way, that's your job too. That's not just my job. That's every single one of your jobs. To walk in that faith to show that production of hope. I want you to turn another place the Lord took me. 1 Corinthians 13, which we, we all know this. I want to read toward the end here. We know this is the love chapter and, and all that. And by the way, I, I won't even go down the, the, the rabbit hole here, but please, if you're the ones that think that the perfect is not Jesus Christ, then you have your eye on the wrong thing. Because the perfect is Jesus Christ. It is not the canonized scripture. It is Jesus Christ. He is the only one who's perfect. And if you don't believe me, just please read the chapter. Even intellectually, it's not hard to figure out. It says, when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childless or childish things. Verse 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. How many of those who believe this is talking about the canonized scripture have seen the perfect face to face? I mean, show me one. It isn't the case because he hasn't done that, and it is not talking about Scripture. It is talking about a person. It is talking about perfect love, who is perfect love. That's Jesus Christ.
But verse 13, there are three things that are given a child of God. Three of the most amazing things in the world. Three of the things that not only get us through this life, but bring us into that place of bringing his kingdom here. And it's verse 13. It's what we just read in 1 Thessalonians. So now, hope, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is, is love. Now, by the way, when we love, truly love, the other two are going to abide. You cannot have a pure abiding of one and not the others. If you have real love for Jesus Christ, guess what? You're going to have faith and you're going to have hope. If you have real faith where you have walked in that faith and you have stepped in that faith, guess what? You're going to have hope because faith produces hope. And you can't have any of it without love. Without loving him, without knowing him, without knowing who purchased you. Took me two other places this morning. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4, and this is when he took, he told me literally as I'm walking up, and I'm thinking, oh man, I don't know if I could pull it up in time. And here he's talking about what is given to the church. And, and man, we put, <laughs> the church intellectually puts a lot into this, this verse here. And in a way, it's a cop-out. Because, well, Lord, you know, okay, I'm not called to be an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a shepherd, or a teacher. Okay, cool. I get to watch. <laughs> Sorry. That's not the case. Do you know, and, and I get the fact that these are offices, but do you know that they're supposed to work together? Do you know that they're supposed to work together even in the same person? Do you know they're supposed to work together in each of us? What does an apostle do? An apostle plows ground. We call them a plower. They're ones that, that, that go through a field that is an unbroken field and they break it up. Right? It, it's kind of like the metaphor I like to use is, is going through a jungle when you want to access the other side. What do you do? You build a road. There has to be somebody who goes in there and knocks down the trees. There has to be somebody with a bulldozer that goes in there and flattens the ground and literally plows that new road. It's not just a pastor that's called to that. It's not just one with an apolistic, apostolic, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's not someone with an apostolic gifting that, okay, we just lay it on all on their shoulders. They're supposed to plow and then and then we're all good. We just kind of go when the road's paved. No. You have your own road. Your road may be different than my road, but you have a road. God is calling you even now to plow something in your life for the benefit of others. It might be the benefit of your spouse. It might be the benefit of your children. It might be the benefit of your neighbors. But it is for others benefit, not your own. But guess what? You get to benefit too. Because the person who plows the road gets to see first. They're usually filled with vision. They usually see that road long before that road was ever there. Man, that, that's one of the, it, it, Lex and I have conversations about this all the time. Because for me, I'm, I'm five, ten years in the future, and there's a road there, and I'm thinking, you know, we, we just go there. And she's thinking like, okay, wait a second, that's not been plowed yet. You're not going to go there in 30 minutes. Right? It has to be plowed. 
We have to go in and plow that. You have a road in your own life that you are supposed to be plowing. And the purpose of plowing is to make it easier for others. Why do you think that those were called in times of old? Abraham was called to begin a nation that was the Lord's. Plucked from all the nations that God had given away out of the Tower of Babel. Abraham was plowing new ground to believe. I mean, Abraham was only 200 years or so right around there, I think, when he was born after the Tower of Babel. Coming from a world that did not believe God, which was only 150 years or somewhere around there after the, the flood. You know, no wonder God was frustrated. I destroyed everything 150 years later, and you're doing the same thing. You're not believing me. You're choosing these other gods over me. Don't look at the Old Testament. Don't look at old times and think, yeah, man, they were stupid. Because we do the same thing. We do the same thing. The difference is our God is technology. Our God is self-sufficiency. Our God may be something else that we can control, but it's no different. It's about control. Do we keep it or do we give it to him? Do we keep it and have no faith? Do we offer him faith, step in that faith, and give him control? I'll tell you, that's why Paul put this in Ephesians because there are different callings. There are prophets that will speak the word of the Lord, and I'm thankful for them. By the way, in my, my comment before about, about them being wrong, it's not that the word was wrong. Sometimes their interpretation of it is wrong. I, I have a I, I, I very rarely listen to a prophet speak outside of the word that's given. Because so often a prophet will desire to apply it to what they know. And that, that's just incorrect. <laughs> the whole point is that it's supposed to be applied to something we don't know. I mean, that's what a prophecy is. But God uses prophets. In fact, he said in Amos that he does nothing without telling his prophets. So he uses them. He uses evangelists. Those who would proclaim the word of God, who would proclaim the gospel. He uses shepherds. Those who would care for a flock. Those who would draw a family together and guide a family. He uses teachers that would teach something that is unknown to those who do not understand. He uses these things. But it is all for the fact that he is drawing us to a unity. Let's read on. Verse 12, he, he does all these, he provides these, these people in these things to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. What? Until. Until. That is a huge word. That is a huge word to understand in the Word of God. Until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He's not saying until we're all dead and go to heaven. It's not what he's saying. He's saying that this will be provided until the church comes to a place of maturity to understand that his kingdom is to be here. What is our portion of that? Faith. Faith. To believe that that's what he's doing. If you want to be used in the kingdom of God, you cannot do it without a basis of faith. You can't. And along with that comes a lot of other things, like courage. Oh man, don't think you're not going to have to have courage in faith, because Satan gets to test that faith. It's one thing to say you 
believe something, it's another thing to stand up in front of thousands of people and proclaim that you believe it. That's a whole other thing. How about standing up in front of people that hate you and say you believe it with a gun to your head? Okay, man, that is walking in your faith. And there are some that that's going to be asked of. But by all, it is about walking in our faith. It is about the testing of that faith. It is to bring the unity of the body, and not just unity so we can all go to heaven, you know, get to float in our cloud and get our mansion and whatever we do. Which, by the way, that... The bride has no clue what heaven's really like. If she had a clue, she would be so excited. And to recognize that his kingdom is what he wants here. Not that, oh, Lord, I, I just, please, let me die tomorrow. No. Oh, man, man. Lord, just like Paul said, I, I, I want to be with you, but I know you have a place for me here to do this work. So I choose to be here. I know, Lord, you want your kingdom to be brought to this earth. And I know that you are calling me to be a part of that. So I stand in faith. I stand believing what you're going to do. And then it starts to unify us. Brings us to a unity to where Revelation 3.9 will be the case. Last place he took me, Ephesians 5. And I think we'll do the update next week, but that's okay. Ephesians 5, I want to start at verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of the thing, because of these things, these empty words, the wrath of the God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. He's talking to those who know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. So walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and righteous and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful work of darkness but expose them. Guess what? You're called to be a part of this fight. You're not called to be a standby. To just kind of sit beside and hope it all goes good and I have faith that it's going to go good so there's my portion. No. He said, be discerning of what's going on. Be discerning of what is happening around you. If you react in fear, be discerning of that. Because remember, the Bible said, fear is a spirit. We're not to have the spirit of fear, the Bible said, but of a sound mind. We're to discern what's going on. We're to discern the times in which we live. Why? Because we are an instrument in our faith that God is using to change it. This country will be changed. This administration, this fake administration, will be out. There's no doubt about that. That's, that's, that's not even the thing. But we walk in that faith until one of two things happens, honestly. We walk in that faith until it happens. Or we walk in that faith until God gives us individually the power to walk in that change. Some of you will be called to make declarations that will change. Are you ready for that? Because it's not just about feel good. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's about death. Sometimes it's about judgment. Oh, wait a second. Now we're talking Old Testament here. That's it. No, under a new covenant. Phew. Yeah, we are. 
And wouldn't it be awesome if the bride would actually be in partnership with Jesus Christ to claim it? Because as far as I can see, the bride still dies. As far as I can see, the bride still lives in a world that is controlled by the enemy. Something that Jesus paid for 2,000 years ago, and we have not stepped up in relationship with him to claim it. But we're supposed to. Now, there are many that are. There is a remnant that is. Those are the plowers. Those are the ones willing to knock down the trees, to have to dodge when they try to fall on you. (laughs) And those people are rewarded by that faith. But God is bringing a change. I I apologize. We are going to go one more place. And I'm trying to figure out. I know it's in Ezekiel. I think it's, let's let's try six. Ezekiel six, maybe. If I could stop shaking and actually pull it up. Um. No, it's not six. Hold on, sorry. I know it's Ezekiel. Uh, Okay, Ezekiel seven. Oh, no wonder I couldn't find it. I'm in Ezra. That's what happens when I shake. Sorry. Okay. Ezekiel chapter 7. Ezekiel chapter (laughs) 8. Sorry. Come on. In a second, I'm just going to tell you what it is. Well, he brought it to my mind, but I can't find the verse now. But I'm going to tell you about it because he brought it to my mind. There, there is a verse that it was Israel heavily entrenched in idolatry, heavily entrenched in believing other gods over Jehovah. And he came in and he proclaimed, this was, this was literally when the second temple, you know, the second temple period, and there was a second temple. Um, this was when the Holy Spirit that was the Shekinah glory left the temple. And it was because of what was going on. It was because of the idol idol worship. And so this vision that Ezekiel had was God telling a spirit that had a pad of paper. And he said, go throughout this city, this city of Jerusalem. And he said, place a mark on the forehead of everyone who grieves over the abominations that go on in this city. And then after that, he released a death angel to take the life of all who did not have that mark. Now understand, I'm not equating to the mark of the beast and mark of God. I'm not, forget the mark. Remember what he said. Set those aside who were grieved 
over what was going on. Let me fashion that for today. How many hearts in this country are grieved by what's going on in this country? How many hearts are grieved by abortion? How many hearts are grieved by this literal lie of the enemy that would use even Scripture to say that they're doing what's right? How many are grieved? You may not be able to do anything about it, but your heart needs to be grieved, and I'm, I'm sure everybody here is. But we're coming to a time, and that time is upon us, where those marks are being placed because God knows the heart. And what is going to come is that judgment of those who would oppose him, but also that judgment of those who would say, yeah, you turn that back on. The judgment of those who would say, well, you know, I'm just kind of watching. I'm just kind of watching. You know, I trust God, but I'm just kind of watching. Hmm? I can't understand. <laughs> Nine? Nine? Nine, four. Oh, Ezekiel 9, 4. Thank you. Ezekiel 9, 4. <laughs> Let's go there. I would have just ended, so the fact that I'm going longer is Wendy's fault. Just want to make that clear. All right, go to Ezekiel 9. Thank you, Wendy. Yep, there it is. Verse 4, And the Lord said to him, Pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all abominations that are committed, committed in it. And to the others, he said, in my hearing, pass through the city after him and strike. Your eyes shall not spare and you shall have no pity. Okay, remember, these are God's people. Okay, this is his nation. Recognize that. Kill old men outright, young men and maidens, little children and women, but touch no one on whom is the mark. If you stop there, it'd be tough enough. But then it says, and begin at my sanctuary. Lord says, judgment begins in the church first. Why? Because we're responsible. We're responsible for that faith. We're responsible to open our mouths we're responsible to walk in that faith. So, of course, it's going to begin there. Now, I, I, I know, I know it's, it's hard to come here, and I, and I know this church is different, but I'm talking maybe more online. I, I know it's tough to come and just hear negative, 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 negative. You know, death. You know, the Lord told me in this probably five or six years ago that we are going to have a third of the world that will die through this process in that three and a half year period, which I think we're a year and a half into or so. Okay, that, that's pretty massive. That's pretty massive. Never happened since the flood. That's pretty massive. That's, that's kind of a downer, you know, kind of, a, kind of depressing. But yet, what does it mean for a world to wor worship a righteous God? It means his justice has to be as important as his grace. And it is. It's no less important to God. Why? Because it was taken away from him. He created this idea of intimacy with his creation, with Adam and Eve. And it was taken from him. Now taken because he gave choice, because he wanted love. Don't think his justice is just something of the Old Testament. Don't think his justice is not something that, well, yeah, but you know, that, I, I, that's not really how it works now. Yeah, it does. The difference is those who are deceived may not recognize it till it's too late. But we're coming to a time where that ticket is going to be called. 
And God is expecting his bride to rise up. He's expecting her to walk in that faith, to open her mouth, to discern the times around her, to discern what's going, around, going on properly. Discernment's a tricky thing, man. You could discern all day improperly. Well, you know, I pull up this and that, and I, I, I got this where, you know, I read this blog and that blog, and I, I've, you know, done 80 hours of research, and I'm pretty sure this is what it means. If you did not include the Holy Spirit in every single piece of that, you missed it. You missed it. And that's a lot of what's going on right now. Be, because, and it, it's not that some of those things aren't true. It's that God is the one that wants to do this. And you have a responsibility in it. And that responsibility is faith and walking out that faith. Lex, come on up. One of the things the Lord told us when he first revealed that it, Ignition's tagline was going to be an army rising up was that he said it would first begin in Nigeria. And so that's partly why um, we have, the, the part of the team came back today and we have an assignment of the Lord to do um, this coming week and it's very, very significant and we'll be able to share it with you more when the Lord releases it to us fully. But that has been what he's been doing, is establishing um, his people and growing and building all of our faith so that we can be that army rising up. And, and part of the army aspect isn't just to raise a bunch of individual fighters, um, but to unify and bring about the army strength of unity together. And it is also the fulfillment of the, the greatest commandment, that we love the Lord first with everything, and then we love each other as ourselves. And there is strength in that. So many Christians have gone, become defeated because they're fighting a battle all by themselves. And the only um, compelling they get to unite with the rest of the bride is a, a ploy to make them feel guilty for how much church attendance they either comply with or don't, you know. It's never through the right lens of why even, why? Why do we not forsake the assembling together? Why is it that, that we should be together? Um, when you don't understand that, and it's all about pleasing the religious hierarchy of, of the structure of, you know, the church of organizations, um, it becomes something you resist, especially um, when it's absent of the working of the Holy Spirit. So this, this unity and um, what God is doing is very, very significant, and um, I, I think it's so cool that the Lord, when he wants to say something, he will give that same word in a different way to every gathering, every group. You know, when we're all seeking the same Holy Spirit, it is, it's always amazing to me how that it won't be just, well, they did that in that class because that person is, has, had, has been in a different place of interest. When the Holy Spirit wants to say something to the whole bride, he will bring it out. He will, if we're really seeking him and not just asking him to stamp his approval on our interest to teach or to share, but really saying, Lord, what do you want to say to your people? What do you want to say to me? And then what do you want to say to your people through me, whatever position that I have? You're going to find a unity in that message. And isn't it cool, ladies who are in the class, how similar it was to what he shared this morning. And, um, and I think very transparently, it was, it was on the fly, not of the Holy Spirit, but of Greg, because he didn't know until he was taking steps up here what, what he was going to say. So there are, um, there's a lot of things that we want you to understand what's happening in Nigeria, not just so that you're aware of the missions arm of Ignition Church. It's not that at all. To know what God is doing because of what he said he would begin with and how connected it is to what we are doing here. It is, um, it's really, really significant. We've also tried to break down those kind of paradigms that missions work is only for the mission-minded, for those who are missions called. And um, it's kind of like a segment of the church that some are involved in and some are not. And the Lord wants us, whether your physical body will ever be there or not, he wants us all together thinking of this lost and dying world who needs a savior through people that are willing to let Jesus manifest through them. 
and, and be the light, right? So we're going to pray, and um, we're just going to close this portion of the service with um, just asking God to just really drive this deep down in our hearts. Father God, I praise you and thank you for how you are moving, how you are working, God. What you are doing with every person's yes is so extraordinary. God, I know I can only, as Brooke said earlier in worship, that I can only speak for myself, God, that every time I am willing to surrender more of myself, my flesh, my, my humanity, and my, my natural way of thinking to you and believe for who you are and what you're doing and your ways, according to Isaiah 55, 8, 9, that are higher than mine. Oh, God, what you will do with that yes, what you will do to reveal yourself to us, God, and what you've done to reveal yourself to me is so amazing. And God, you start with those who will believe you without reservation. God, help us to just be willing to believe you, to not hold back our belief, not hold back our faith under the guise of, well, we must protect ourselves from deception. God, the very way to protect ourselves from deception is to purely seek you, to seek you and you alone, and then you respond and you reveal yourself clearly. So we don't have to wonder whether it's you, but we do have to believe and step with abandon and let you protect us. God, I, I just thank you for how you move, how you work. And God, if we are interested truly in relationship with you and you alone with a pure motive, oh God, you never fail. You never fail. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. When we pursue the high that you offer, when we pursue the provision instead of you, Jehovah Rapha, our provider, that's what will get us, lead us astray. Because the high will lead us to other highs of familiar spirits and false gods. But when you are all we want, God, just like Jesus, you said, if we desire bread, will you give us a stone? How much more will you give us the Holy Spirit if we ask of it? So God, I just thank you. I thank you that when we seek you, we will find you. Even when the enemy is trying to psych us out, you give us through Jesus a way to cast down those imaginations and proud arguments that come against the knowledge of God. I thank you so much. The weapons of our warfare are mighty through you, Christ Jesus. I thank you. I just praise you, God. Help us to rise in that confident faith. There's nothing that has built my confidence more than knowing you more as my Lord and my Savior. And then, my friend... Because first you are my Lord, then you are my friend. My friendship cannot be where your Lordship first isn't. And so, God, I just pray that you'd help each of us to surrender fully, fully to you, to seek you with all of our heart. You have the answer for every struggle, every problem, every torment of our mind, every seeming lack around us, whether it be financial or or uh, even emotional resolutions to conflicts. Every need, you, you supply all of our need. God, I thank you for that promise in Philippians 4.19. God, we just love you. We praise you. Grow our faith, God, because, oh, filled with you, we are an unstoppable army, and we don't even have to be that big to do great and mighty things in your name. So I just praise you today. Please drive this home so deep and you are able to when we allow our soil of our hearts to be cultivated by that three-pronged instrument, the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Let us open our hearts so that you can drive that, that seed down and produce a harvest of faith. I just love you, Lord. I just worship you. Thank you for this word, God. Even though it was given so spontaneously to Greg, thank you for his obedience to just to just let out, even in, in what humanly can feel like a, an unprepared place, God. It is not about us. It is about you and what you desire to say. So I thank you and I praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.